Hi, I'm Michael Bryan. I'm managing partner of Vino Venue, and I'm the founder of the Atlanta Wine School. Today, I have the pleasure of taking you into the Chaputier family, their portfolio of wines, and also um, uh, some really nice insights into the Rhone Valley of France, one of the most important appellations for wine from that country. I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about this place. It gets its name from the Rhone Glacier, which sits above Lake Geneva on the Swiss side. If you can imagine 180 million years ago, water rushing from Lake Geneva and this glacier, forming a river 25 kilometers wide, pouring out into the Mediterranean Sea, carving out a landscape and dragging along with it debris and lots of eroded Alps rock, which today makes up a very important part of the landscape and the growing area of the Rhone. The French have a wonderful word for this type of landscape. They call it terroir. And terroir is what you see as making up really the holistic growing environment for a particular vineyard. Um, we're gonna be covering three wines today. The first is going to be a white wine made by the Chaputier family, uh, a blanc, as they would say. Secondly, a rouge. And third, a very special wine uh, that takes its name from a village called Chateauneuf du Pape. So let me start out a little bit by just telling you about this area. The Rhone Valley is an appellation that is split into two parts, the northern part and the southern part. The northern part is going to be where the grape Syrah has become famous and the white grape Viognier. The um, northern part is a fairly small production area. The soils are mainly granitic. Uh, it is a continental climate, which means that summers are quite hot, but also winters are quite cool, and they do get snow there. On the southern side, which is where the bulk of the wine comes from, and the first, and actually all three of our wines today are going to be from the southern side. Uh, the southern side is also granitic soils, but we start to introduce a lot more um, limestone and um, some very, very big rocks that the British call pudding stones, the French call galet, we call potatoes. But they are almost small football sized rocks that tend to find themselves laying across the tops of the vineyards. These have a dramatic effect on the growing environment there. One, because they retain heat, but also because they reflect light. So you end up with an area that gets 315 days of sunshine add that landscape of rock to it, you end up with wines that have a really dark pigmentation on the red side, um, a fullness in the mouth, good alcohol. Uh, they, the French like to say that you can taste the sun in your mouth with these wines. We would say as Americans, they're very uh, California-like, although they do have a nice minerally, almost uh, earthy sort of edge. Um, the grapes that, uh, that are very well known in the south, as opposed to the Syrah from the north, are going to be more about Grenache. In fact, all three of the wines that I want to speak to you today about are Grenache based. The very first one is a white Grenache, they would say Grenache Blanc. The second wine is Grenache Rouge or Grenache Noir. And then the third wine is also from Dark Grenache or Grenache Noir. Um, so let me start off by telling you, since we understand the region and the Rhone Valley, um, a little bit about the Chaputier family. This is the producer that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be tasting some of their wines with here shortly. The Chaputier family got its start as a family winemaking uh, group in the early 19th century. Today, the gentleman who presides over all of their production is Michel Chaputier. And um, one of the really interesting things about this um, winery, number one, is that this particular label, Belarouche, which is a good entry-level Cote de Rhone Appalachian um, wine, is the number one selling Cote de Rhone wine in the United States. And so this is a wine that you're definitely going to have lots of opportunity to see from restaurants to retail package stores, uh, even chain stores. So there's probably lots of ways that you can interface with this wine. The other thing that makes uh, these folks unique, other than being wildly successful, is they made the decision in 1996 to place on all of their labels Braille. And if you, if you ever have the opportunity to pick up one of their labels, you'll um, be able to feel the Braille that is embedded, or I should say debossed, on the exterior of these labels. 
This is a tribute to a um, Monsieur Le Césarin, and he is the proprietor of one of the most famous vineyards in the Rhone, specifically the Northern Rhone of Hermitage. And so as a tribute to Monsieur Le Césarin, who um, um, uh, was uh, not gifted with sight, uh, they wanted to put Braille on all of their labels. Um, and they've continued to do that now for almost 20 years, which is fantastic. Uh, certainly makes uh, wine available to a, a segment of the population who uh, would otherwise have a little more difficulty in shopping for wine. And so I'm going to start off by tasting the Belarouche Blanc. Again, this is an entry-level uh, Cote de Rhone Appalachian wine for them. It is the Belarouche Blanc. And as mentioned earlier, it is primarily Grenache Blanc, although it does have a little bit of Claret and Berbelon. Both of those are uh, also French grapes, very popular in the area. All three really contribute something different to the blend. Uh, the Grenache Blanc is more about pear and apple. Um, the Claret is more about Hawthorne, and the Berbelon really gives it the freshness and the acidity. So for those of you who are learning to enjoy wine, or maybe this is already a passion that you've developed, you'll probably see those who um, are in the sommelier trade, those who sell wine, those who purvey wine, those who are comfortable with wine, you'd often see them swirling a glass like this. This is because alcohol's flavors and aromas are trapped in the wine's alcohol. A wine like this is not very high alcohol, it's 13, 13 and percent, but that's enough to trap in a lot of flavor. In order to really get that flavor to escape, I swirl the wine. And so by the evaporation of the alcohol, the wine literally wafts out of the glass and starts to speak to me, at least initially through my nose. And there's that wonderful pear, apple, some earth tones, a little bit of sort of wet stone. In the mouth, the wine is fat and full. One of the great things I like about Rhone wines is they have some weight and some fortitude and some strength. There's an athleticism that comes through in these wines. It affords you the ability not just to have dainty, pretty sorts of cuisine with it. You can actually go into some of the meat fare, some sausages, some grilled sausages. You could even do grilled lamb with a, with a wine like this. But I think most people are going to find enjoyment of just having this during reception or aperitif or cocktail hour. It's just a nice glass of wine to sit down and enjoy after a long day. So on the red wine, we have the Belarouche Rouge. Okay, this is also Cote de Rhone, which is the big appellation that we find in the Rhone Valley. It means that the fruit can be sourced from anywhere that is the delimited area of the Cote de Rhone area. And by the way, I didn't mention earlier, but from a historical fact, this is the very first place that France decided the Appalachian system should begin. Um, and in fact, they had even begun it informally back in the early 18th century. You saw barrels of wine that were very carefully stamped with the letters CDR to stand for Cote de Rhone. So they've known for many uh, centuries that they've got a very special ability to grow grapes and make wine in that part of France. So on the red side, as I mentioned, since we're doing all Grenache wines today, this is primarily Grenache Noir and with a little bit of Syrah. So remember we talked about Syrah sort of being grown more in the northern part of the Rhone. There's a great deal of it in the south as well. You, you tend to see both of these grapes join sort of as brothers in so many of the wines that come out of the Rhone Valley. So on the nose for a wine like this, you've got a preponderance of red and black fruits. The Grenache really gives you this wonderful sort of black raspberry. It also gives you a little bit of strawberry, and there's some great cherry that comes through, although I think the cherry is a little bit more black. The Syrah is the one that gives you a little bit of black pepper that comes through, which is kind of fun. So it's a really nice blend. Neither of these two Belarusche wines have seen any oak barrel maturation. They're all about really reflecting holistically the environment that they come from without a strong influence from man. So you can kind of think of it as them capturing the soul of the vineyard and putting it into a bottle. So, 
with all of those days of sunshine and all of that heat, you really taste the, the ripeness that comes through in this. It is much like a black raspberry cobbler or it's um, a cherry pie kind of cherry that comes through. One of the things that I like about this area though that again separates it from our own domestic American wines is while we have the ripeness, we have the alcohol, we have the color, it doesn't forsake where it comes from. It gives us a little bit of the earth, a little bit of the rock comes through in these wines. One of my friends here in the South likes to say that the Cote d'Iron wines are like a blackberry rolling across a barn floor. And I think this really, um, really captures that sort of sentiment. So let's move on to our third wine. I don't have an example of it to open and pour today, but this is Chapoutier's Chateauneuf du Pape, specifically La Bernardine. So La Bernardine is one of their special labels for a Chateauneuf du Pape wine. And, and understand and appreciate that Chateauneuf du Pape is one of the most famous wines to come out of France. It was the very first appellation created in 1926. It started off the entire system around regulating wine for a country whose number one gross domestic product is wine. Chateauneuf du Pape became popular in the early 13th century when Avignon was the papal seat of the Catholic Church. There were seven popes in a span of 120 years and two of those seven were crazy about wine. They decided that they would summer in an area a little bit north of the city of Avignon because it was slightly higher elevation, it was a little bit cooler, and as vineyards were planted in this area and wines were made, it didn't take long for the popes to recognize that these wines were spectacular, they were very special. And so they anointed the area as a village, they named it after their home, hence the name Chateauneuf du Pape means the house of the Pope or the castle of the Pope and the wines have been famous ever since. They, they are um, a little bit smaller production, it's not a very large area um, and so to supply the world with these wines means that you do expect a little bit more uh, in, in terms of paying for these wines. There's an interesting rule that it still applies today on these wines that allows for them to be made from 13 traditional grapes from the area. Um, they don't do that very often anymore. In fact, again, the primary grape in Chapoutier's La Bernardine is Grenache. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, today's short session on the Rhone Valley and the wines of Chapoutier. I've enjoyed being your guide.